Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT racers to discuss their lives, their journeys, their ambitions and their relationship with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. I'm Chris Pritchard and with me is Steve Plater. Steve, how are we doing? Good, Chris, thanks. All good, tip-top, good weekend. Good, glad to hear it. Listen, we've been getting some feedback now. We've had a few of these podcasts out. We're getting good reviews, but I just want to pick a few up. Just read them out to you and um, get your take on these. So this one was a five-star review, and they said, five-star podcast, but what is going on with Steve Plater's voice? Listen, (laughs) I... Maybe... No, no. I'm just talking nicely, that's all. Oh, it's it's the Queen's English. Of course. What about this one? Love the podcast. What's happened to Plater's voice? Has he had new teeth? <laughs> now, I know they're paying us pretty well, but I didn't think they were paying us that well. <laughs> that must be from somebody like Michael Rutter. He's always criticising <laughs> me. Think so? I have, I, he thinks I have my hair dyed every five minutes. <laughs> Even my kids think so now. He says it that often. Brilliant. Right, on that point, if you are listening to this podcast right now and you are enjoying it, please leave us a rating and a review because clearly we do read them all and Steve enjoys them. (laughs) Anyway, let's get on to this week's guest, Lee Johnston. Now, Lee was actually our guinea pig here on the TT podcast, and this was recorded back in November of 2021 for our pilot episode, but it was far too good of a chat not to share with you all. So on today's episode of the TT Podcast, we're joined by Lee Johnston, one of the most popular characters in the racing paddock. He's blessed us with his presence at the TT for almost a decade after making somewhat of an unconventional debut back in 2012. Since then, he's had his fair share of highs and lows, unexpected podiums, fiery crashes, factory rides, and of course, a first TT victory with his very own team last time out in 2019. Born in Northern Ireland and now raised in Yorkshire, he has been shining in the British Supersport Championship during the COVID-enforced break from the TT, proving there is plenty of life in this old dog yet. Lee Johnson, how are we doing? Absolutely fabulous. (laughs) Are you really? Yeah, well, it's all an act, isn't it? No, life is good, mate, life is good. Yeah, it would be a lot better if we were closer to getting back to the TT, but as far as things go right now, life is good. Mate, every single day is a step closer, don't forget. Yeah, that is the that is the positive. This is like being on one of them positive speaking uh, vlogs, isn't it? Well, we like we like to promote positive, <laughs> a positive mindset for you, for you racers. <laughs> What's been keeping you busy recently? Uh, obviously, the, the BSB has just finished. So um, up until a few weeks ago, um, it was all doing BSB. But I think the little pub at the end of my road has probably been the, the busiest part of my last three weeks. <laughs> so I was just trying to trying to get a bit of downtime and, and obviously with the family and stuff as well. So yeah, life's good, mate. Off season's well and truly started then. Yeah, yeah. Trying to get all that weight I lost back on for winter. Where have you been getting your fix from then? Just drinking pints or... Oh, mate, the Guinness in that pub's good, so it is. So I was feeling a little bit homesick, but that just takes the edge <laughs> off. And um, I'm actually going home, home this weekend for the first time in two years, so... I thought West Yorkshire was home. Well, yeah, yeah, for um, for the BSB fans, yeah, but now when I'm back road racing, I'm from Northern Ireland, so <laughs> it's... Uh, I'm, like the, I'm like the Mackenzies, I've got mixed uh, nationality, so, yeah, it's all good. So, Lee, we like to take the riders back to the TT start line. You're rolling up to the start, the guy grabs you by the shoulder, and he gives you that tap. What feelings are you experiencing, are you feeling in that moment? (laughs) Um, Thinking about that even makes my hands sweat. (laughs) I think think the... At the very point of when that's happening, because you're obviously, well, you know, you're concentrating on the guy in the in the with the flag. Do you know what I mean? That's your sole focus right there. So some sometimes you don't even necessarily subconsciously feel him tap you. Do you know what I mean? Because you're already that engaged on that flag moving, letting the clutch out, all of these things. And I think that is probably the first time where you're not really nervous, you know what I mean? Because all the nerves is the whole period before and you've got to there and then your brain is that engaged on what's happening. So it, it's actually the first part of enjoying and not not <laughs> worrying about what worrying about what's going to happen. So for me, that is the, the trigger point of, of the, the best part of the TT because you're riding your motorbike. Everything else is hassle or aggro or distress or... Do you know what I mean? But that literally... 
you've just put your visor down, you've literally engaged gear and you are about to set off down Bray Hill and there's nothing else in your head other than going as fast as you possibly can for the next two, four, six laps and, and concentrating on all the things and hopefully seeing the first pit board and it's saying P1 plus 10. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's the, that's the dream. And then when it does, you're second guessing whether he's got it right or not. But yeah, so I think the tap is not not so much as the, the flag drop and the actual letting the clutch out and all them things triggering in your brain as to then the calm happens, do you know what I mean? Because obviously from all this stress and, and panic, there is just calm of first gear, second gear, third gear, do you know what I mean? Traffic lights over the crest, down Bray Hill. That's... So what's the first thing that comes into your head after the tap on the shoulder and the clutch is out? Go. That's it, do you know what I mean? That That is the... You're already thinking, before you've even got to the traffic lights, you're already thinking, oh, stay right a little bit, get right over to the wall, open it up, get over the jump straight, do you know what I mean? Click sixth gear, down the bottom of the hill, it gets a little bit of a tank slapper on because you've got a full tank of fuel and it's going to bottom out more because you've got a full tank of fuel and stay out from the curb a little bit further and just all these things that are subconsciously happening in your brain that... Someone at the bottom of the hill is just going, oh, he rolled off a bit, the big girl, why is he? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So um, all them things that I think looking you in the eye, you can talk and your brain's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? But if you're saying that to someone that's stood on the side of the road, they're thinking, what, he thought about 300 things and he hasn't even got in the first mile. But that's that's yeah. what you do. You talk yourself around and, and hopefully get back before everybody else does. How did life start out for you? Obviously, over in Northern Ireland as a youngster, as a, as, a, as a nipper. Obviously, I come from a really wealthy, privileged family. So I went to private school <laughs> and all of these things. So that's that's sort of what me and me and Pritch have in common. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, really normal life. If I'm honest, I, I played football up until I was about 15, 16. Yeah. And honestly, I was probably better at that than I was riding motorbikes. <laughs> and I wish to God I'd have stayed for the for the financial side as well. But um, no, yeah, I did that till till I was 15, 16, and then started starting riding motorbikes quite... Well, for modern day, it's quite late now to not start to that age. But yeah, my dad and my family was always into into bikes, and um, I used to go and watch all the road racing, come to watch World Superbikes at Brands Hatch and stuff. So yeah, it was always in me and stuff, and then it just took me a, a bit longer to figure out that's what, I, that's what I really wanted to do. Late starter. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I still look so fresh now, I think. <laughs> Hey Lee, what 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 position did you used to play as a footballer? Obviously striker, because that's the least amount of running, running doing. So uh, really? and plus I got all the all the glory. Yeah, yeah, mate. Nobody wants to be a defender, do they? You get no glory for that, do you? True, and your size as well. Yeah, you're not, yeah. not going to be the most fierce defender, are you? Didn't score too many headers, if I'm honest. It was it was never going to be basketball, was it? No, no, yeah, that's <laughs> not the way forward. So I so I guess with all these podcasts, we have to go back to the start of where it all began in terms of uh, motorcycling for you. So obviously you went and watched a lot of racing, but when was the bug well and truly in you to to take that step to start racing? I think yeah. So I I did actually. So the first race and I did was mini motos. I had some like field bikes and like every kid. At, Back then, you just rip round on a on a like an off road bike, and I think health and safety wasn't sort of top of the agenda back then. So you could sort of ride it down the road a little bit to get to the field and things like that, and that was just the way things were, sort of thing. But I didn't start racing uh, mini motos till I think I was fifteen, and then I sort of turned up. One of my friends was racing, and I turned up just to watch that. Even and there was one of these days where you could like have a go and they give you like elbow pads and knee pads and things like that there so um and it turned out I was quite fast so I thought oh it's like anything if you're quite good at it you suddenly become a bit more interested and uh yeah my dad bought me a bike and we won the championship and stuff and then he was quite into bikes obviously but he knew nothing about running a two-stroke and stuff so he says well we can't buy like a 125 which would have been the natural progression because we don't know what we're doing. So he just went and bought me a 600. So I went from riding a mini moto to riding a, <laughs> riding a 600. So um, yeah, we skipped a, skipped a level as such. But yeah, that, this was all in Ireland. And then I didn't come to England until I was 18, I think. Uh, come over and then we won the Junior Superstock Championship 
in 18 and then 19 went to do super sport for raceways i actually got a fun, this is a funny story so when when i did my first ever super sport race so obviously when i was i won the junior super stock championship i was on the podium all the time and it was like i thought oh this is just this is normal sort of thing and the first time first ever super sport race i did was a first round was a brands hatch and uh steve beat me to the podium he was third right and i was fourth and i was absolutely wounded i absolutely hit i thought oh, he's just ruined my whole career now this is my first race up in super sport and he beat me yeah steve so what did you think to this little upstart coming into the super sport and trying to steal podiums off you well it, it was riding for raceways at the time you know and obviously i knew there was cheating obviously their bikes were a lot faster than mine it's, it stands stood out a mile you know and not just because it's got a two foot tall jockey on it you know that it should be riding mini moto but flipping neck it uh no mate I, I was on to in all fairness i was on it in 2009 and uh you know you was kind of pushing hard but lee so for you what was that your insight was to come to british championship what was your first kind of you know, when I started racing, I had no uh, intention of ever being professional. It was just purely to get rid of my adrenaline on track. Yeah, but it was it was different then. When, once life calmed down after the war and everything, you know, the the world was a different place, and <laughs> and it's uh, it's a lot more calm now as such. But yeah, I think I think the big thing if you speak to anyone like of not this isn't me not being a smart ass of your generation, so like Whitman or anything, it was really common to get a road license. That was your first form of transport, wasn't it? So you went went like Billy on the road and thought, oh, he's pretty good. Why does he not go? And which is completely different now. It's really rare for most modern bike riders to have a license as such in it. So um, I think that's that's probably the difference in it. And then sometimes then you would have started like you started quite late, even for your time frame, didn't you? As 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 what racers did. Yeah, very much so. You're just rubbing it in now, aren't you? He told us he told us earlier, Chris. He's going for his bike <laughs> test this afternoon. Uh, oh, I mean, don't I'm sweating I, I, my I passed my I passed my bike test before he was born. Honestly, it's mad. It's mad. <laughs> I probably I probably passed mine as well. You don't have a bike license. <laughs> sure, I got a bike license before I got a car license. Yeah, but they were in, in, in cereal boxes in, in, then. It means e-bike. Yeah, not a license yeah. for an e-bike. So what? So what? What about what about the roads? Was that was that on the radar to begin with? Being from North Ireland, and obviously it's a massive passion out there. Yeah, I, I think the the first thing I real like obviously I went to the northwest every year and and um, like being from where I'm from, Richard Britton was like the biggest rider and he was obviously my dad knew him and stuff, so I thought this was amazing. And I, but I think I I think at no point did I ever dream about being world champion and stuff. I thought, oh, I'd love to go to BSB and and try and win there. And and it was in 2000, I think it was 2011 or 12, the first time I did the Northwest. And I'd been winning in England and stuff. And I come back and went quite well the Northwest and then got on the podium in the Ulster and stuff. And I remember thinking, everybody's more impressed by this than they are like me winning in British Championship and stuff. And then that sort of hit home then. I realised that even as far as like talking to sponsors and stuff, this is definitely going to help my career going forward and stuff. And I honestly, when, when I did the first Northwest, I wasn't really that fussed about going and stuff. I thought, yeah, the team was already going with Gaz and stuff like that there. So I thought, yeah, I'll go along. It'll be a laugh, this, that and the other. And after the first practice session, I was like, Oh, this is definitely for me. This is it's abs- I absolutely loved it. And then I remember someone else did it at the same time with me, and they were going on and on and on about like wanting to go and wanting to go. And I think they did four laps in practice, and then said, "No, it's not for me." So it's different. It's one of them things. It's either for a year or it's not. And I think now when you when you look at all the risk factors and everything, you think, "Oh, I wish I didn't love it so much." You know what I mean? Because like you said, it, it's it's genuinely in you. And, as much as I love doing British Championship and stuff at the minute, and it's going really well, I just there's something itching in me to get back road racing. So um, yeah, it's just one of them things. I guess I, I guess there's a question for both of you here. But what is it? What is that thing that's in you that makes you want to do that more and more? Oh, I think for me, you know, it was a a bucket list thing to a certain degree. You know, and I was. I was uh, very early in my career, I went to the North West 200, but it was kind of my style, the mass start and elbows and so on, even though I was a very smooth, calculated rider. <laughs> 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 but, um, and I think realistically, I, the TT, obviously I was um, 
you know, a lot of the people I raced against in, in British Championship were, were TT winners, and uh, you know, it was kind of a, it was another discipline for me that something I wanted to not conquer, but to achieve a goal of, of to be to be honest, to begin with, just to stand on the podium. But to answer your question, I think it's just something with inside you. It's that adrenaline rush and and the competitive nature to go and achieve one of your goals. Yeah, that's that, what he said is very true. I, I think for me, uh, being completely honest, is that there's a little bit of me that enjoys doing things that you shouldn't really be allowed to do. Even from when I was a kid, it's just maybe growing up a bit naughty or whatever. And I'll never forget the first lap I did at the TT and you're going like because milking them boys are fast like you think anywhere else you go oh yeah the the whatever the instructor's going to be in the way this that and the other I'll let me and Carl Horace did ours together and I remember setting off thinking bloody hell I'm, we're going here like I'm not I'm not it's not steady and I got up over the mountain and I just thought this is absolutely amazing I said someone is going to step out now and go nope sorry this is illegal you're not allowed to do it and it, it, it's that's never left you know what I mean the first time first lap I go back going over the mountain and stuff and I get the same feeling every time I said this is just absolutely and even like you, if you struggle through the two weeks being there and it's physical and it's hard on your body and everything but the last lap of the last race at some point, it comes into your head thinking, I have to wait a whole other year now before I can get back again. So it's, um, yeah, I, 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 to someone that hasn't read on it, it, it's so hard to try and explain what that feeling is actually like. Just just going back to that, you know, you said your first lap around, obviously that's behind, that's a controlled lap. Yeah. You're behind a travelling marshal or Milky is one of the, the top guys that uh, looks after and teaches and coaches new riders out there. Yeah, and the the job they do is amazing. Do you know what I mean? For the information they try and pump into you before getting out, and do you know what it, it is to think about and everything. But the thing that makes me laugh is listening to new kids now and stuff. They're like, yeah, yeah, I've watched loads of laps, and I'm sitting there going, how are you comparing sitting on your sofa in your house and riding down Bray Hill? It's like you are absolutely insane. Do you know what, I mean? what are you going to do? Fall off the side of your sofa? That is not. There's no comparison. So, so what, let's let's go to Bray Hill, right? So, I've I've been there a couple of years now, and I still can't fathom it out. I I still have so much respect and love for what you 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 do, and I'm glad that you guys decide to do it because it entertains me no <laughs> no end. But the thing is, what does it feel like? You stood on that start line, you've got the hand on your shoulder, and you're waiting for that tap. Like, what is going through your head? Is is it all serene? Is it all? Is there a calm that comes over you before you go? Are you are you like on on edge? I think that part is okay because you're literally you're at the point of setting. Let, you're literally thinking about letting the clutch out. So that is the only thing you're thinking of. If I could somehow figure out how to teleport myself from the motorhome to that point, missing out the forty five minutes in between that, that would be the dream because that is the worst. That forty-five minute siren, the thirty-minute siren, the fi- that is the worst part of my whole career turned into forty-five minutes. I hate that part. And the worst thing I think is if if you were going up onto the start. It's getting better and better now because there's less and less people there. Obviously, there's people like you guys trying to shove a <laughs> microphone in your mouth, which is not ideal. But before, when there was more people, everybody looks at you and they're nervous, right? And you can tell that I'm like, "Why are you nervous? You're sta- You're not even setting off down the road. So if you're nervous, that means I should be absolutely breaking it. So that makes you worse. So I think if they could get rid of all them people that are nervous, because your mechanics and all, they're doing a job, so they're like fully focused on what they're doing so they're not they're not nervous as such or they they know not to show you because they they're trying to do the best by you but it's all these other these other Joe blogs that are stood there absolutely bricking it for no other reason than that you're about to set off are you really kind of pumped, you know, for a result uh, on the on the start line? You obviously, you just want to get on with it. You want to get out on your own and and uh, get a tap on the shoulder and go. But is it are you pumped for the result, or is it just you just want to get away from everybody that's around that starting position to, for a bit of peace and quiet? Does it? Yeah, I think it's it's more that. I think it's more the stress of the build up. Do you know what I mean? And the the biggest thing is when you are like a, a front runner or in with a chance, then it's more the the risk of disappointment I think that's the biggest thing do you know what I mean because I've learned in my career now that 
wanting something too bad is a, is a bad thing for the way I ride the motorbike. Do you know what I mean? I need to ride the motorbike relaxed and calm and, you know, feel what I'm doing rather than trying to put a round peg into a square hole. It just doesn't work for my style and it definitely doesn't work for me at the TT. And I think that's why it took me so long to come good at the TT because I could be a little bit aggressive at the Northwest and at the Ulster and it, it made me win. But at the TT, it's just not the... It's not the way to go. So, um, yeah, it took me a little bit longer than possibly it should have to figure that out. So so you're, so you're bringing a different kind of riding technique and a, and a skill to the TT that you would on compared to the North West? No, I don't want to say definitely, but even I think that's what's happened this year in British Championship. Like, I have tried to to not want want it so bad and you know what I mean and, and balance the lap out a bit more and actually think a bit more about what I'm doing and that's what like I haven't at 32 year old I haven't suddenly become faster on a motorbike do you know what I mean it's come it's come from just figuring the job out a little bit I haven't the raw speed hasn't got better it's literally just being a little bit more calculated and and that was the same thing at the TT do you know what I mean we went off nice and relaxed the good thing was that the pundits there were that bad. No one even thought to mention me before the race. So I don't know who was I don't know who was commentating on that race, but it was mega because I, I watched the build up before they mentioned Dean and Hickman and everyone. And uh, yeah, Johnson was leading, won the race, and there was absolutely no mention of him before the before the race. So that made me that made me giggle. So hopefully, if they do that again next year, that'll be lovely. Pressure's going to be on next year. We're going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're only going to let yourself down next year. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pressure's on. So, obviously, that first ever, you know, for me, when I first went to the TT, obviously, I was quite a late starter. And I knew full well after my very first lap behind the travelling marshal what the future was going to be. How was that for you? Did it kind of tick the box instantly? No, honestly, I, I, I think because there was that much going on and... I think even because I was behind Milky and me and Carl had spoke about it before, like we were going to let each other pass to give each other a decent a decent look at what was happening and, and such like. So I think I was that busy thinking. It was probably, I can't remember, say between 10 and 15 laps in when I got my first lap of actually tying everything together. Not saying it was any way fast or incredibly good lap or tidy, but it was the first time I think I probably rid the whole way around and I wasn't thinking about, oh, it's a left, it's a right, it's a left. It was like actually getting into a little bit more of a rhythm. So And, and then when that happened, I, I sort of thought, oh, yeah, this is this is a bit of me. This is, I actually, I am enjoying the, the feeling that I'm getting right now. You made your debut on a Ducati, right? Oh, bad decision. <laughs> Go on, explain, because to me, I, I don't see Ducati and Italian um, manufacturing going hand in hand with the rough course of the of the TT. Am I right? Uh, this pains me to say, but yeah, with your little knowledge, you have even even yeah beat me <laughs> beat me with that one. But yeah, it, it, the bike was bad. To be honest, the bike was that bad at the Northwest for weaving. McGuinness actually offered to give me a fire blade just so I wouldn't go there on the Ducati, and he gives nobody nothing for free. So <laughs> that that should have been a massive alarm bell ringing at, at that point. But. Um, yeah, the the bike was just. I remember this is bad. I remember it broke down. Uh, I was coming towards Balaf Bridge and the, well, it didn't break down. It absolutely blew itself to pieces, <laughs> and put oil all over the road. So this was like third or fourth night of practice, and they stopped practice because of me. So I walked to Balaf, and the crowd was like proper upset, man, because I they had obviously like been waiting for three hours. And uh, Nobby comes along, blows up, and stops the whole practice. So I was like, "Oh my god, this is—they're just going to hate me forever now." <laughs> I was distraught. <laughs> yeah. So the answer to that question is no. That bike was not good for the Alamon TT. You turned things around pretty quick. You know, from that first out in, I think, what was it, 2012, and then 15, you stood on the podium. That's a fast turnaround. Yeah, and I think the biggest—the biggest thing. Um, that drove that was obviously it's no uh, secret that I'm not very big and um, <laughs> everybody was at me and at me about oh I'm not fit to ride big bikes and it's getting harder now because they are getting faster and faster but in the super stock race to get that first that podium and stuff it was up that 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 one now it still probably means as much to me as winning the super sport race I think and even, the, the, well, it's not funny, but my lad said that, because Hillier was leading me by, I think, four or five seconds going on to the, at Ramsey. So it was like quite a lot to come back. But that's my best part of the 
of the track and I think his lads were actually already starting to walk down to the winner's enclosure and they had to turn around because I only beat him by like less than a second maybe so not that I don't mean that in a bare way or anything but because it genuinely showed that nobody expected me to to be fit to do that after four laps on a on a big bike so yeah that means a lot to me and even even seeing Hutchie and Michael's face on the podium they were looking at me as if to say what what are you doing here do you know what I mean why even though we'd won that race at the northwest and stuff that year it's just a completely different um a different thing so yeah that that one means as much because it's the first podium and on a on on a, a, a big bike um it means a lot to me so let's go from from one of your highlights to to a bit of a low light 2017 you had your big crash on the Paget's honda right yeah a massive flaming fireball i remember talking to you a few months after it but it looked good though didn't it there's no point in having a little one if you're gonna go you might as well go big and <laughs> oh mate you did it proper yeah honestly that year i had him i said this is it you know what i mean i'm gonna win a super short race i was on the Paget's bike the bike was capable of winning and i think we'd been quickest on practice and we were quickest that night and stuff and um i don't actually remember anything i don't remember probably I don't remember leaving the island after the crash and stuff. I remember getting back to our house and stuff like that there. But I was up in the on the start line and stuff for the senior, I think, because I'd been released at a hospital. But I've no, I've no recollection of that whatsoever. Um, really? Yeah. So I'd had a, I can't remember what all I did. I did a couple of vertebrae, um, tailbone, hands, my jaw maybe, and my brain was bleeding. So. I think um, that answers a lot of questions. Yeah, because I was, I was, I, all honesty, I was probably too intelligent before, so it sort of <laughs> leveled, <laughs> it sort of leveled that out for me, which was a, which was a big burden to carry. But yeah, it was massive, and I think the saving thing is that I don't remember, so I've got no, I've got no worry about it or whatever. It's just that's something that's happened, and I'm extremely lucky for for the outcome. Do you know what I mean? It could have could have obviously been fatal and stuff, but and the care I received afterwards and everything was amazing, but. The, the first, this is actually funny. The first time I went back to the island was obviously then the classic uh, in August after that crash. And I'll never forget this. I was sitting on the start line and some old guy, I have no idea who, who was 70 year old, decided just to mosey up to me and go, oh, this will be your first time round since you, you nearly died at, uh, at the TT. <laughs> and that is all he said. He just walked up. like he, You could tell he wasn't he wasn't being malicious or anything. And I just thought, at what point in your brain would you ever think that was a good idea to say that to someone sitting on the start line? And he just walked off. And even the, the get, because at the Classic TT, we obviously ride for other teams and stuff. And the, the mechanic with me sort of looked at me and said, are you, he was more upset than I was. He was like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, that's just his opinion, isn't it? He's not lying, he's telling the truth. But I had forgot all about it until he just decided to remind me three seconds before I set off down Bray Hill. Yeah. But what was the actual feeling? Were you, were you nervous? Was there some, or was it because you couldn't remember actually actually what happened? You was cool with it? No, I just couldn't. Yeah, just because I couldn't remember anything in my brain. I don't. And honestly, I I remember the pain afterwards because obviously your tailbone and and um, your back and stuff's quite a sore thing. But like two weeks after the the accident, I was like. I was fully... Even, well, I, I don't remember this, but Christy said to me, I woke up in the hospital and asked them what day it was and, you know, what day it was and stuff, and they were thinking because I didn't know where I was, but I, I was trying to figure out how many days I had to the Ulster Grand Prix, and and I said to the doctor, I was like, oh, that's all right, then I'll be fit to race at the Ulster, and he, said, he was like, when is that next year or whatever? And I said, like, no, it's in August and stuff, and he was like, no way, that's not possible. But in my head, I had to have something to to go at, to, to target, yeah, yeah, to make yeah. it and stuff, and obviously Christy was quite angry with me and stuff, and rightfully so because it was sat in the hospital. You know what I mean? She was having to wash me and all sorts, so it wasn't exactly looking possible. But we got there and got on the podium and stuff at the Ulster show, and I was fuming because I didn't win. <laughs> and what, what you know, obviously you touched on a, a little nerve there with with obviously family, friends, and obviously your, your other half. You know. Now I've retired and then obviously working in the paddock and you see so much of that, of, of obviously the nervousness of the families and people around you. How was it at home, you know, with, with having a big crash like that? Yeah, I think that was probably the first um, proper big crash Christy seen. And, and she's quite re- relaxed. When it comes to the racing side of things, she's she's really relaxed and so is my mum. 
So much so to the fact, I think in the hospital, she said that when my mum and her was sat there, and obviously because I was on Clive's bike, so Clive's daughter and whoever had come to make sure I was okay, and I think they were more upset than my mum and my missus, so the doctor went to them thinking that they were the family, and not actually, not actually. So that probably gives it gives it away. They weren't even bothered. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, she's she's really good. And I think the big thing is she knows that when she met me, this was my life, and and that's it. Do you know what I mean? It hasn't developed from nowhere. So um, yeah, she's really supportive, I suppose. Which is you need that in in for the amount of commitment you have to make to to do this as a job. You can't do it on your own, and you can't. You can't be battling against something that every time you get home, it's, there's aggro involved. So, um, yeah, she's really supportive. There's there's so much I want to talk about, Lee. Um, but what I want to do is move move on to 2018 because obviously you've had this big crash. You didn't you didn't have any results in the TT yet. You got you know probably the biggest signing of your career moving to the factory under team. Yeah. What does that feel like knowing that? the legends that have ridden for them and then all of a sudden they, they're knocking on your door for some reason. They obviously clearly didn't have anybody else to sign. Probably, yeah, yeah. Honestly, <laughs> probably a day after I rode the bike, I thought, oh, this is... Um... But it's one of them, when you grow up... What do you mean? What, oh, what do you mean when you rode the bike? It just, it wasn't for me and it wasn't right. just... Superbike is this Yeah, up? yeah. And um, growing up in the environment we grew up in, if you ask any kid in any form of racing... Who would you want to ride for? And they go the factory Honda team. That is it. You know, it just looks the most fat. And maybe the old person would say the factory Yamaha team, or whatever. But generally, the factory Honda team is the biggest thing. So, you, it was one of them where I couldn't not. They said to be fair, the offer was there in in fifteen when I'd had a really good year, and I, because I the team I was with and I wanted to stay, and a little bit of that come from. In, in 18, Phil was selling the company and he says, right, we sort of need to cut the racing off and this good this offer come in and he was like, oh yeah, he's the same as me, it's a factory Honda ride, everything's great and it just, yeah, it just, it was a long, that was a long year on a bike that I just, I didn't agree with the bike and I think then certain things didn't want to get changed in the team and stuff and it was just not, not what it was cracked up to be and yeah, I was lucky then that I still had the option the year after to go back to to the team I had before which which was really good. Do you feel like if you had more say in how the bike was set up and what you could change that it might have been a bit different? Yeah, I think so and Steve knows this that it... In a factory team, that's just not the way the way things work. Do you know what I mean? He's sat here like completely agreeing with me silently. So everybody, he's, <laughs> he's taken he's taken fifty percent of the blame. And it's just that's it's just a different environment. It, it, Honda's a massive machine. Do you know what I mean? And and you're a little cog in that. So yeah, and I struggled with that. I think more so because I was that used to um, having a say and you know what what we wanted to do and stuff like that. There. So yeah, it was slightly different. That was pretty much what I was going to say. You know, you've you're renowned for running your own setup, your own team, and do a fabulous job. Not just visually, but obviously, it's uh, you've got great people around you. But how difficult was that going working with other guys? And some of them you knew, obviously, and some yeah. of them you took from that. But um, but you know, for a for a corporate team rather than a happy go lucky team, shall we say? Yeah, I think that was the that was the the big thing, and I'm probably well known for being quite honest with what. I said and stuff and that was the hardest thing because when you're genuinely not happy and then not not being fit to say and stuff like that and at the end of the day I I I started racing motorbikes because I wanted to race motorbikes I didn't start racing them because it was ever going to be a job I've just been lucky enough to blag my way into this so at that point I just thought what well, you know what I mean for the money I'm earning I'd sooner just I, I genuinely said I'd said to Phil and stuff I goes oh I'd just rather go to work I think because I'm not do you know what I mean and it was stressing me out and then times are, when times are hard you know what I mean it, you're not you're, you know the TT's a long two weeks when when things aren't going your way it's the best place in the world when everything's amazing and everyone's patting you on the back and you, you feel 10 feet tall but when everyone's asking you the same question what's going on why is this happening this and you, you can't you for someone that me like me that's quite honest to, to then have to delay to people and just say oh yeah it's fine this is fine and stuff it was um, yeah it was quite hard I suppose it's your one it's your one shot in the year, isn't it? It's not like you've got thirteen weeks of trying something and if that doesn't work you can move on to the next one. You put all your eggs in that one basket and I I just remember the 
one of the last things I saw of you on the well, it wasn't even you on the bike, but you were pushing the bike. I think it broke down in the senior, and you were pushing the bike back up the um, Richardson Road. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it, and I and I just looked at it. I was like, that pretty much just sums up your TT. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was definitely definitely testing, but that's life. And and then if you didn't have that, then do you know what I mean? It maybe not led on to what I have now and stuff. So I'm I'm grateful. I learned some valuable lessons and stuff, and. I think the biggest thing I learned from it was that I just probably spent the rest of my career looking at these factory teams thinking that I'm missing something, I'm missing something. And I know now, I think that's why I'm so committed to, to my team because I 110% believe I've got as good a stuff as anybody else. And if I don't win on it, then it's it's me on the day or someone was slightly better than me on the day. So that that's a great thing to have in your pocket because a lot of bike racers, as Steve knows, they they can't they struggle to be fit to understand that do you know what I mean so I'm completely happy with where I am now and I'll I'll hopefully stay here till I finish racing. So Honda racing not not the best of years for you mate you know and you were very lucky to have you know a good personal sponsor to get set up with with the Ashcourt racing side of things you know and not just at British Championship but especially on the roads as well. Yeah, it's it's been no secret probably from the last six years or more of my career. Um, Phil Reed's been a massive, massive um, involvement, and we're a lot closer probably even than some of my family members, if I'm totally honest. And I know it's very, very hard in this day and age to get an opinion off someone that there is genuinely no outcome for them. Do you know what I mean? So the, it's definitely not a financial benefit for him because he spent a lot of money. But I know that if I ring him up and I go, what do you think of this? And it, his uh, opinion is genuinely what is best for me so that is and it's not like asking your dad or you that are trying he obviously obviously really cares about my well-being but he fully is committed to what is the best thing for me to try and win races and stuff and um to have that in a team manager or a team boss as such is is a very very rare thing and on the other side of that i really really understand that and i appreciate everything i've got so at other times when there was other offers and stuff to go places and stuff far more money at the time and everything i wholly wanted to stay where i was because i knew for the for the longevity of my career and the well-being of of my mental health and everything that was the best place to be so um yeah i was really really lucky and and now the the team's just going from from strength to strength i think with with the british championship and stuff this year it's it's put us in good stead for rolling into next year Lee, explain it to me as a bit of a newbie, really. How does a team like this work? Because it is completely private. How much of a role apart from racing do you take in this team? So basically, it's it's quite rare nowadays for the rider to run the team as well. But that's sort of what I... Last year, not, not so much. We split it quite a bit. So I'm really lucky in the crew chief I have. A crew chief normally is just your data guy, your electronics guy, your suspension and stuff like that there. But Roger in my team actually runs the team as well. But this year we've made a slight little change where he's trying to step back a bit because he wants to do less less time, which is completely understandable. And um, so I'm obviously doing a lot more. So I actually do quite a lot of the organising, run and order and everything. So yeah, which which is quite strange, you know what I mean? Even as regards to designing the bikes, getting sponsors on the bikes, um, as well as my personal sponsors and stuff. So yeah, we we're ramping it up a lot more in this winter and stuff. But obviously, Roger's going to be there to to back me up uh, in any decisions I make and stuff. But yeah, it's as as from next year, I'll be running the team as well as as riding the bikes and stuff. Essentially, it's a club team or a clubman's team that you you're just running with a massive budget. Well, I, I wish I wish the word massive was the <laughs> was a thing, but yeah, we are a genuine privateer team. We buy all the bikes. We've got no assistance from any manufacturer. We buy the Yamahas, buy the BMs. The biggest thing we have, obviously, is is other companies then like either Litec or Reactive Parts and stuff that come on board who are suppliers of rear sets, bodywork, all these things that all add up. So um, yeah, and obviously, I'm I'm average to good rider so on the roads we get tire deals and and stuff like that there so it is it is it is good in the sense of being that way for road racing because then you get to pick so if yamaha's got the best 600 if bm's got the best big bike when you ride for a factory team or a a team that's supported then you don't get that chance so in one sense i'm the, the benefit to all this is i'm lucky enough to have to have phil reed that can actually 
to back the team and and make these decisions and then and then we can pick proper bikes and stuff to give us the best chance to win on so like i said before i fully believe that i'm in a better situation now than most people in a factory team so it's all good who makes the main decisions you know we're, we're seeing now more and more the Alaman tt of course is uh, once a, once a year uh, in June every year and a lot of the top riders now are going off and doing different championships mainly at British Superbikes to get, keep themselves sharp ready to attack the uh, the TT course you know you've been running at Supersport this year obviously there's been no TT for a couple of years is that a decision of yours or of Phil's? Yeah well, it was a little bit we, we sort of make everything together and, and with Roger and, and the other the other guys in the team I try and involve everybody as much as possible because Everybody has to be away from home so much, do you know what I mean? And I, I sat them all down and I says, right, we would like to go and do the British Championship. You know, is everybody happy with that? And the first thing they all said, right, we're not going if you're not going to fully commit to having a go. And I said, yeah. I said, genuinely now, last year or this year just gone is the first time where I've never had to worry about getting injured for the TT and everything and I could fully commit to having a a go at the British Championship and that's where it all stemmed from. Um, right now, we're trying to put some places put some things in place to try and do some more British Championship than that we have done previously next year so hopefully if that all goes according to plan then um, we should be back doing a little bit more than what we have done before but maybe not as much as, as last year Lee, we can't leave you without talking about your crowning glory 2019 TT Supersport Race 1, Race Victory first ever TT Victory it makes me smile when somebody says it. Do you want to know something funny? My mechanics all just call it a T because they say the race got cut short, so it's not actually a TT. <laughs> I've only I've only won a T, but um, yeah, it, amazing. And it, as as anybody says it to me or like you've said it there now, it just makes me smile. Do you know what I mean? And when you've put so much, I think more so like when I said. If I had have won it with Honda or I had have won it with another team and stuff, it obviously it would still mean a, a hell of a lot. But literally, that we set that team up in the December before. Do you know what I mean? Bought trucks, bought bikes, did absolutely everything, getting everything in in line. So, and we went committing just to try and win the Super Sport race. That was the plan all along. We sacrificed big bike time and everything to do that. So. Basically, when the plan actually comes off, which doesn't happen too often, it means it means so much more. And to do it with all the guys that that we picked to have in the team and wanted to be in the team and everything, so yeah, it's a really close, a close knit unit. And um, be honest, do you think if it had gone the whole distance, you would have still won it? Oh, by about thirty five seconds. But <laughs> nobody wants to say that. <laughs> um, no, luckily, luckily, which is strange for me, I got really well out of the gate, and I was off at eleven. Um, a number was changed, and Hickman was in front of me, and I'd literally just pulled enough time on him to catch him and use him as a really good marker. So. Hopefully, I think that I would have been fit to just sit. Sit. It's not easy sitting behind Peter Hickman anywhere, and definitely not around the TT. But um, that would have been the the plan, or that was the thought process at the time. And honestly, only for Pete as well, I would have pulled into the pits. So realistically, it, it, without him in two senses, he made me win because he seen the checkered flag out. Because when we got to the start line, there was a little bit of confusion, and I was ready, obviously committed to pull into into the pit lane, and and he went across the line, and I followed him. So. It was, uh, so Pete, Pete won you that TT basically. Yeah, pretty That's much. I did obviously give him all the prize money because he was hard up because he'd only won three or four others. So um, I obviously give him my few quid as well. You just mentioned there, you know, the emotional side. Uh, just thinking back to when the penny dropped because you weren't quite sure coming back down the return road. No. You know, when the penny finally dropped that you was a TT winner. Just explain that emotion and how it feels, not just for you, but for the family, the team, because it's a pretty much family knit team, yours anyway. Yeah, massively. And it <laughs> the first, when you pull in the return road, obviously you turn around left back on yourself. And there was this guy at the fence going absolutely bananas. And I thought, and I, I pulled up beside him and I was like, have a one. And he was just shouting and shouting. I was like, well, I can't even tell whether you're saying yes, no or anything. So I had to, I, I left him and then I had to ask somebody else. I was like, have I won or not? And he was like, yeah, I think I think you have. And I thought, oh, I'm not getting excited yet until I see, well, I call him Philip, Paul Phillips standing and directing you in. And then when I seen him and he, he said to me then, I was like, yeah, it's um, an incredible, incredible feeling that I'll never, ever forget. So, um, yeah, it's it was amazing. And like you say, pulling into Park Fermi and... 
Phil being there and my family being there and the team, which are pretty much my family all being there, it was a it was a really an amazing moment and yeah, I'll cherish it forever. It's fabulous, you know, being around that area, obviously with the cameras and the microphones and just seeing the emotions flooding out for something you've been trying to achieve for so many years, it's fabulous and kind of takes me back, I suppose, yeah. a little bit to 2009, but uh, there's not many places in the world you see families and, and your whole team so emotional. Yeah, I think, and and the even obviously the crowd get to be into that part and you can't hide, you know what I mean, you can't hide the automatic reaction and... And even things like when other, the, the massive respect in, in our sport, and I, I suppose there is a little bit in BSB, but nowhere near to the level of road racing. When you have other, the guy you've just beat is genuinely happy for you, whether it be Pete or Dean or whatever, and vice versa, and their mechanics are the first people to come over and say, well, because they know what you've had to commit to do that job, do you know what I mean? And and that's the that's the thing you I think you, you won't get in any other sport in the world, whether it be bike racing or Formula One or whatever it's just completely different to the TT so the victory does it appease you in in a way that you could step away from the sport and think I've achieved what I wanted to or does it get in your blood to think I want to feel that again I want to feel that every year I go back now honestly and I've said this like to to people close to me I I totally believe that I've massively out done for the little bit of ability that I have do you know what I mean if someone had said when I set off that I'd have won a TT a North West Ulster Grand Prix, a British Championship, no way. Do you know what I mean? For the for the ability that I believe I have, I've way out said it. I would love to win another TT, and I'm going to commit to trying to do that. But I can honestly say, when I retire, I'm more than content with with what I have what I have achieved so far. So, yeah. I've blagged it pretty much. <laughs> Aren't we all just blagging it? Yeah. Yeah. So what? So what about 2022? You know, we're we're almost we're, we're you're a long way down the line. It's downtime. You've been spending a little bit of time in the pub, but <laughs> surely your planning has been going forward ready for 22. And what are you doing? Yeah, massively. We've had a couple of meetings, and like I said, um, the good thing off the back of the BSB, and I think I think I can't blame anyone for it, but. Because before we went to do British Championship, uh, quite a few sponsors were not really bothered. Because I'm a road racer and we're a road race team, the money was predominantly for the TT. And they were like, oh, we're not that bothered. And it's funny now that because we've had the season, everyone's keen as mustard to get back to do some more British Championship. So it's a really nice thing. And, and that was sort of our main focus is obviously the TT in the Northwest and if the Ulster happens and stuff. And then trying to fit some BSBs around that in planning to help with the road so that that is the full plan we've got some some different bikes coming new bikes coming and and building more r6s and stuff so we're on with with on with doing that and we still have the bmw so quite a lot is staying and and quite a lot of new stuff is coming so um we normally try and get the bulk of everything done before christmas and then it takes a little bit of pressure off to, to to sort of the start of next year and then think about getting testing and stuff which is something we haven't been fit to do for a few years so hopefully we can get back to back to Spain or, or Portugal or whatever and get some get some actual mileage on the new bikes and stuff. You know, with that, you say about testing, you know, I know a lot of teams spend time at Castlecombe, but how difficult is that, you know, especially as a team owner, come rider, to organise to go testing somewhere that sort of replicates a road course? Yeah, I think I think the with having a little bit more experience now, I've sort of realised that to go and try and to test something for the TT is just is is not possible. Do you know what I mean? You can have all these great ideas and feelings in the world, but realistically, to get that feeling, the closest thing you get is going to the northwest, or or and it's not really even a replica of of the TT. So until you get there, and you, that's the other big thing with surrounding yourself with people with knowledge. Do you know what I mean? They can easily go right. This is not worth worrying about because when we get there. X, Y, and Z will happen and we'll go this direction. Do you know what I mean? So that's where I'm quite lucky with all the experience. Like the average age of my mechanics is 55. Do you know what I mean? That's They're nearly dead. So, <laughs> do you know. <laughs> um, but people, and, and and that's why that is. It's it's completely different to road rate or to, to British Championship. You can have all these kids come in on laptops and whatever. But when you get there, you want someone that's done 20 TTs. They've done endless amount of pit stops you know what I mean it, it, none of this it phases them and that's that's the difference I think so when I go testing it's predominantly for either putting mileage on bikes getting me used to riding the bike or getting ready for British Championship and then once we get to the roads I just let that figure itself out So <clears throat> you've had a very successful 21 couple of uh, British Supersport wins third in the Championship 
You're a TT winner now on the Super Sport. What's your outlook? And this will depend on how we're going to react to you. Well, we're going to be blowing smoke up your backside <laughs> for next year. But what's your yeah. outlook for 22 at the Isle of Man TT races? Yeah, obviously, like even before I went and, and won it, you genuinely have to believe you're capable of winning because you're, the, you're well, you're sort of turning petrol into noise all the ways, aren't you? So I, I genuinely believe we, we, sh- we should be going back. If we're fit and healthy before the TT, we should be going back aiming to try and win at least some small bike races, whether it be a lightweight TT or Super Sport TT. Genuinely, if I ever got another big bike TT podium, whether it be the Super Stock or the the Super Bike race, I would be absolutely over the moon. And I've, realistically, I don't see that as being a possibility to win a big bike race because I'm just not physically big enough to, to ride one. So I don't see us exerting a lot of energy in that that side of it and stuff and try and win... Try and win um, more smaller bike races because at the end of the day in 10 years time no one ever introduces you as 10 times podium they just say he's won a TT he's won two TTs and that's it so that's the plan so Lee moving into 2022 obviously um, anybody that watches your YouTube channel and people if you're not subscribed to him please go and subscribe to him his ego needs the massaging (laughs) (laughs) But you also announced um, you've suffered, well, I guess an illness. Um, do you want to explain it? Because I don't want to pronounce it and get it wrong, but things haven't been plain sailing away from the TT, have they? Uh, no. So it sort of pretty much happened last year. Um, I started getting quite sore at different times, and I do quite a lot of cycling, uh, and I put it down to that. So I stopped and started and stopped, and... At the end up, I ended up going to, there's a, a really good physio, like within 200 metres from my house that Matt Roberts put me into. And um, he has quite a few connections in the England football side and stuff. So he literally seen me once and he said, there's something, you know, not right with you because you're fit and well and everything. And the pain I was suffering at the time was, was really, really bad. So basically we wanted to figure out whether it was mechanical or... Um, to do with with my genetics as such so we went and got quite a few scans and x-rays and blood tests and stuff and they figured out really quickly that what it um what it was so it's uh angliospondylitis is the actual full name so it's, it's pretty much inflammation of the blood on the spine so it just made that i couldn't genuinely at the worst point before i started i had quite a few steroid injections in my si joint which is like the bottom of your back and it's, i can say it's not a nice injection I, to have i've had that one done that yes. is bad. so um i had a few of them and stuff just to tie me over until we got we got on the on the actual drugs and stuff but i can say that the, i went private and stuff to figure it out quickly but as soon as i got on to the nhs they've been absolutely amazing with with my medication and everything so that was sort of one of the driving factors into doing the British Championship because I needed to see if I was actually going to be fit to ride the bike again because at, at probably in January of this year, I was like pretty much bed bound. I couldn't get up and walk around. If I walked, I would literally want, I couldn't sit down, lie down. It was, it got really, really bad. So um, that at that point, we weren't even planning on racing. And luckily enough, the, the, the medication started in February and worked really well straight away for me which was even rare but I think it, this all come from the fact that I'd been diagnosed so quickly and it had an onset so most people suffer with this for maybe two three years before normal normal maybe GPs and stuff figure figure it out so I was really lucky to have good people and then obviously with the NHS and stuff so at the minute I feel really good obviously sometimes I'm a little bit sore and stuff and I take some other drugs on top of my injections and stuff but at the minute I just um, I get an injection every two weeks and that that sort of does me but no ill effects during the British Superbikes or anything like that you feel you feel that you uh, you know as long as you can get to the TT without breaking anything that you're going to go there and know that you can get through those two weeks yeah they they don't know 100% a lot about it as far as sports people and stuff and they know that the injections are good for everyday people but they're not probably putting their body through as much strain and stress and as as mine. And I think the big the big thing is like rest and stuff. So right at the start after a BSB weekend, literally Monday, Tuesday, I would be not in bed, but like not far from the sofa at any time. I wasn't I wasn't a lot of use. Do you know what I mean? So and that's gradually got better and better. And now, like at at the end of the year, I was like I could have done a BSB, and then we had some back to back meetings, and it 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 hasn't really harmed me as such. So, but. 
that's also led into a little bit of the thinking about of the TT and really having to, we're going to have to manage time on the bikes and, and riding big bikes and stuff because why waste energy on something you've little or no chance of winning on to, to take away 20% of something that you have a good chance of winning on. So that's the big talking point at the minute as to what, what the tactics are going to be. You know, as far as that goes with the bikes, it's commonly been said that obviously you, you struggle a little bit, not struggle, but not quite as good on the, on the bigger bikes with your physique. You know, 2023, two lightweight races, is that a big bonus for Lee Johnson? Yeah, definitely. That's that's the that's what we were aiming for with buying these um, new lightweight bikes and stuff. And at the end of the day, like I said, in in 10 years' time or five years' time, when someone says how many TTs you've won, you say three or two or one, they don't ask you, did you win a senior, did you win a... Do you know what I mean? Obviously, the senior is the most, the most lucrative one of them all, but if I could win another one of any type of TT, then I would be absolutely more than happy. You all, you're very modest. It's clear that you're modest, and you often refer to yourself as a washed, washed up old racer. But you look at the likes of John McGuinness, Michael Rutter, and they're still there. They're still in the paddock. They're still going down Braille as fast as they can. Like, what's the longevity in your career, realistically? Do you see yourself finishing anytime soon? Um, honestly, I. It's a tough one that because you don't know what's going to happen, or you know, next year could be enough or whatever. But realistically, I have quite a lot of interest in life although i love riding my bike and i do um but i do i love riding my bicycle and stuff as well and i don't want to get to the point where there's loads of things like i want to do around the world different mountain bike races and stuff so at the minute like my full commitment is on on riding my motorbike and i don't want to detour away from that but i also don't want to keep doing that that long that when i do stop i'm not fit to do anything else so Hopefully I can figure that balance out and um, and get it right and still be fit to do do all the other things I want to do um, when I get a bit older. So without answering that question accurately, I don't know. <laughs> right, should we have some quick fire questions? Let's do it. God. Now answering these, you've got to answer one or the other. There's no explanation. Oh, right, so it's like a multiple... Choice. No, I've it's got, not. No. It's not multiple choice. It's just oh. it's it's one of two two answers. Yeah. All right, you <laughs> two ready? answers is enough to confuse him. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah, go. Beer or spirits? Spirits. Dunlop or Pirelli? Dunlop. Super sport or super bike? Super sport. Two strokes or four strokes? Two strokes. Dean Harrison or Pete Hickman? Neither. <laughs> one or the other. Ah. Uh... What, who I'd most like to beat? <laughs> uh, I, I said one of the, it's one answer or the other answer. Dean Harrison. Mass start or time trial? Mass start. Senior TT win or stage win of Tour de France? Oh, bloody hell, that's a tough one. Oh, yeah, probably the senior because it doesn't last as long. Bloody stage Tour de France has <laughs> last forever. <laughs> <laughs> West Yorkshire or Northern Ireland? Oh, I love living here, to be fair, West Yorkshire. Carl Frampton or Mark Cavendish? Carl Frampton. Carburetors or fuel injection? Carburetors. Rossi or Marquez? Rossi. <laughs> a night in with the missus or a night out with the boys? Oh, out with the lads. <laughs> Right. She's never going to watch this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, uh, you're a massive fan of the Mackenzies. Yeah. Taylor or Taz McKenzie? Neil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Taylor or Taz? I'm going to have to say Taylor because Taz gets enough attention, doesn't he? He's won that little British championship recently, so it's gone to his head a bit, bless him. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Lee, thank you so much for joining us on the TT Podcast and hopefully we'll get you back on again at some point to have some more chats. Appreciate you turning up, mate. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> hey, Steve, that was some chat, right? Uh, mate, he's always a character, you know, and he's full of beans. And uh, for a little lad, there's a lot of energy there, without doubt. Absolutely. You know, for a man that's obviously been ill, you know, been flat out racing British Championship, to have a, a massive season in front of him on the roads is going to be uh, exciting. So what do, you, what, what, what do you predict for him coming into this year's CT? Well, you know, I think, as he's mentioned, the smaller bikes are his favourite, but uh, you wouldn't rule him out on both Supersports to start with. 
Do you think that's what he needs to do to try and get his his second TT victory to to really hone in on those super sport bikes and almost put the the big bikes to one side now? Well, it's the thing is with the Alaman TT, there's an awful lot of races over the you know over race week, but of course you know mileage counts. It really does to to keep yourself sharp and without doubt riding that big bike, which is hard work for a little lad. When he gets on the smaller bikes, you know, he feels like he's the big boss and it certainly does help. So the answer to your question is probably yes, uh, and he's very capable. This has been episode five of the TT Podcast. If you've enjoyed it, then please hit that subscribe button and leave us a rating and a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We have plenty more star-studded names from the world of the TT on the way in this series. And here's a little taste of what you can expect from our next guest, Carl Fogarty. I don't know, I just wasn't bothered. I was happy just to try and get a trophy in top 10 or something. But as soon as I went road racing, that was where my heart wanted to be, my head wanted to be. That next episode will be out in two weeks' time. And don't forget, you can get all the latest TT news and features over at iomttracers.com. And be sure to check us out on all the usual socials. We're at TT Racers Official. Thanks for listening. <laughs>